Hello. I am in my workshop trying to get set up for my chain making demo. Um, I'm just really trying to figure out where's a good place to put my uh, stand here so people can see what I'm doing. Um, my workbench, well, I still won't melt my phone. So I don't want to melt my phone. Come on. Oh, come on. You can, you can. My little, I have a little tripod. Oh, come on. You want to stay. Yeah, you do. Okay. I think that'll work. So, awesome. There. Here, I'm going to show you how to do loop and loop chain making. First of all, what is a loop and loop? What are loop and loop chains? This is one in progress. Uh, this is not done with chain mill. These aren't tiny rings going together. They are little loops, and I'm going to make some loops and uh, make some links and I will explain the process as I go that I use to make this chain and let me check my little bin see if I have other styles of chains I do other links this is the exact same chain but a different size of link now, if this looks kind of familiar, uh, remember uh, a year or two ago, it was super popular. All the kids were doing um, rainbow loom bracelets. Yeah, it's the exact same technique with little, little rubber bands, but you're doing it with silver. Exact same technique as rainbow loom. So, this is, these are some of them. And let's see. Here's a finer one. Finer chain. Yes, we're live. And there's a big honking chain. There's another big one, start of one. Again, same chain, this and this. Same chain, different size link gives noticeably different results. So, we are gonna make some links and weave some together. And it can be super time consuming, but I'm not gonna like make 50 million right now. I'm just going to show you what the process is and what it takes. So you start off with fine silver. I'm going to, okay, I would move this thing, but my tripod's kind of, I don't want it to fall over, but I have a wall behind me with silver on it. I'm going to grab some 20 gauge, 20 gauge fine silver. It's my favorite gauge to use. Now, if you're talking about reproduction, you see it a lot in Roman, Greek, and Roman jewelry. Reproduction, 20 gauge is kind of on the heavier side. Uh, they do a lot of like, what I almost call like, I mean, sometimes very delicate, like 24, 26, like practically hair thickness wire. Very delicate. Um, but 20 gauge is fine. Yeah, this one was done with 22. So like 22, 24 seems to be more common. 24 and 26, very delicate. Yeah, this is for the heavier stuff. We got the fine silver. Now, this is fine, not sterling. Fine is 0.999% pure. Uh, or so there's something in my teeth. <laughs> silver, it is almost pure. And the cool, why you can do this technique with this and not say sterling. Here's a good example. This is a cast. It is dark. That's because it's oxidized. It's when exposed to heat. You know, if you get to, if you were to put a piece of sterling silver jewelry on like a hot plate, it would turn dark, and that's the oxidation. So you hit it. You hit it with fire. It oxidizes. You hit this with fire. It doesn't because it's almost pure. Uh, Twenty-two karat gold and up is what the ancient gold jewelry was made with, because that doesn't oxidize. There's no other additives in it. It's it's about, about as pure as you can get while it's still, while it's still, uh, oh, sterling is 0.925, which is 0.925 silver. The rest is whatever. 
Uh, pro tip when you're buying silver. If people uh, say, I can't wear sterling silver, it always makes you break out. Um, I always ask, where was it made? Because legally, to sell it in the United States as sterling silver, it has to be 0.925 silver. The rest can be whatever. So from other countries, it can be nickel, tin, literally tin. Um, all the stuff that makes you break out. America, it tends to be copper which most people don't uh, react horribly to. And that's it's not enough to make you turn green. It, it shouldn't be. If they say, oh, it's sterling silver, but it's turning you green. Yeah. Uh, we actually had a thing where we got some vintage pieces uh, and I was gonna melt them down. They were te uh, tested them. And while they were marked sterling, these were from the seventies, they were not. They were like 60%. It's like, wait a minute. So someone at a melt pot somewhere, uh, whoever was alloying that or melting it down, either they bought a bad alloy to do their cast with, uh, yeah, so, so, someone somewhere wasn't telling the truth. So yeah, that didn't get used. This is why you test. Anyway, so yeah, sterling will oxidize. And this technique we're, we're going to use is we're going to fuse. We're not going to solder. Or solder is where you take a metal that, you know, melts at a lower melting temperature, it kind of fuses, you know, it's sort of like taking two pieces of bread and like taking jelly or something and using it to stick together and it's going to stick and then you smoosh it down. It's really hard to get apart. Um, maybe that's a bad analogy. I don't know. But yeah, it forms, how uh, was it? An interstitial crystalline bond, chemical bond, something like that. Anyway, anyway, can't remember the exact scientific terms for the reaction, but that's what it does when you're soldering. Today we are going to fuse. We are not going to use an alternate an alternate metal to melt to help these to help two pieces, the ends of the wire fuse together to make links. We are going you know, melt make them stick together. We're going to fuse them, which means all, this is what we're gonna do is just this. We won't have to add anything. This is why they could do it in ancient times. They would uh, if they did not use like a blowpipe type torch they would make their little links and stick them in a kiln and they would watch them very carefully and then yank them out before they melted. Which I will melt some just so you guys see what that looks like. So, I cut myself a little length of it. And I have a dowel. Hello everyone, here is my dowel. So it's 20 gauge, fine silver, my dowel. This one is my one half inch dowel. I got it from Joann's a while ago. And I have tape. Why do I need tape? Now in the ancient world they did not use tape, obviously, but I am using it now. And I like to stick it to myself so I can detack it. That way it won't leave any, I know it won't leave any scrunge on this. So usually if I'm doing this, I'll cut like five or six links and stick them all over myself and peel them off as necessary. So this thing has a little hole drilled in the side. And this is where I've been cutting. What you do, take a little hole, put this in your little hole, make a tiny little L bend. That way it's caught. It's caught in there. It's not going. It's only going in like this far. We are going to twisty. Now I may have cut this section too wide. I don't think I cut this length of silver too long because I'm pretty sure usually in the coils I get from my supplier Rio Grande uh, one and a half is usually good. No, nope. it came undone a bit. Well I'll just use this later. Oh wait it's right there. Cut a bit too much. That's okay. Now we stick it down. This is so it doesn't uncoil on us. Awesome. It's no it's good when I go too long on this because I can just use that. Now in the intro world they did not use masking tape. They would just uh, probably make a little coil and cut it with snips.
or may, or alternatively, if they did not use snips, they would set it down on a hard block and use a chisel because they didn't have saws and just go tunk, 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 and just chop little lengths and then make coils. And then make little rings out of them. Oh wait, I'm gonna have to move this further down so you guys can see this. This is called a bench pin. This is a modern jewelry tool and it is beautiful. This helps you saw. It's got this piece of wood here, which you has sloped on the bottom. So if you're if you're going to be like working, if you want to work at an angle, you can use the slope end. I usually like to work flat, so I keep the flat end up. It's got a notch where you can just hold things. And it's got a little hard. Well, this one has a little hard anvil on it, so I can hammer on it when I need to. You see little dents in it for my rivets. Yeah, I'm gonna stick that there. Get my jeweler saw. And cut my coil. Yeah, I'm not going to do the entire coil. This is just so you see the process that goes into making one of those chains. So we've got a little end. That's waste. got silver rings silver rings look at them a little bit of waste put my tape away don't need that put my bell back so we're just doing a little bit right now and I don't need this anymore my workbench is very modular I don't need this Lots of things can move around. So now we're going to do some fusing, but first we have to make sure the ends are really nicely together. So what does that entail? Well, if I were to just, and it fine silver is so soft, you can manipulate it with your fingers. So I can just do that with my fingers. I usually like to push them a little bit beyond, a little bit further. Like I don't put them right up. I push them so they're like that. And then I pull them and then the tension usually makes them go like snap, stay that way. There's just enough tension. It's pretty soft, but it doesn't have a lot of spring, but it has just enough for that to work. Now, here's the secret sauce jeweler tip. If you did that, if you were to look at the end, you could see the end of this. I don't know, camera's not good enough. Can't really do macro. Will it let me? Nope. Well, actually you can kind of, you see how there's a little dark bit, that little dark bit right there right there. That is the break in the ring. You want these ends to be as flush as possible. Those ends are not flush. There is a teeny little gap. And if there's a gap, there's a chance it won't fuse. The silver won't, won't melt and it won't fuse all the way around into a solid ring. So what we need to do is make sure those ends are flush. And here's how I do it. These are parallel jaw pliers. These are something everyone should have who likes to do things with tools because look what the jaws do. See that? They don't do this like duck beak action. They don't do that. They do this. Straight up and down. These things this is one of those things where like everyone says they're good to have. And so I finally bought some, some years, you know, this, this, I bought this a few years back and it was like, oh, why, why didn't I buy these? Like when I first got a charcoal block to work on, why? Because these are amazing. Buy a pair of these. Um, what I like about them though, for this is I can squeeze it like that. And that way I know there's none of this. The ends aren't going to be like that on this plane. And then I give the tip, I, oh, I give the join with the tip a little squeeze and another one. And it is slightly flattened. It's hard to see because the glare, but this is flat. So it goes up and then it's flat and it's okay. Cause we're going to be bending these up and everything later. It's fine. There can be a flat bit but it's flat and the ends are flush now. 
So we're going to take our little completed ring. Let's see if you guys can see it. Okay. I'll put that right there so it's kind of, well, that might be too close. There. I'm trying to gauge through the comments. There. Okay. That looks like a good spot. I'm going to close five. So that's all we need. This is a charcoal block, but a hard charcoal block. And I'm just going to do these five. So we're going to make five links. So you can see the process. Meh. Now I'm going to do six. That honestly looks off. Sometimes when you set them down, because it's so soft, it'll like kind of fall out of, but it has just enough spring, it might want to fall out of where you want it. When you set it down, that's enough for the ends to go whoop. So there we go. The silver goes down there. So normally I would saw many coils and I would spend a decent amount of time filling this thing up entirely. I'll do an extra so you guys, well one, in case I do melt one anyway, because you're going to have a bit of loss. You just are. Either because I'll be distracted because I'm doing this not paying attention, as close as attention as I normally would, or a breeze will come through my window and just divert the flame of my torch and melt it weird, so... Yeah, there. There's any sorts of reasons, or you know, in, when you're starting out, you are going to lose silver. You're just going to melt silver. You are. Guaranteed. You're going to lose silver. And right now, it's like, what, 12 or 13? So it's not stupid expensive. Not like when it was 17 that one time. Ugh. That hurt. Actually, we didn't. I think it broke 20 once, if I recall correctly. Anyway, I made eight. Eight little rings, ready to go. Ugh. Don't need that here. Torch time. This is my torch. It is oxygen propane torch. Gonna light it up. There's the propane. Now you you don't need the fancy torch shoes. You can do this with a little uh, hand butane torch. In fact, I will do uh, some of these with my little butane torch. But I like my, uh, I like my Smith Middle Little Torch. There we go. It's got some extra stuff. I love that bleed off. There we go. <laughs> what I'm doing, maybe you can see it better if I do that, is I'm going to heat this ring until it melts, basically. And the ends will melt together. It hits what is called liquidus stage, where it effectively turns into a liquid. And there will be a flash. It's like it turns into the Terminator, just for a second. That one is real nice. Sometimes they go real good. But you don't need a nice, and I, you know, I, I'm kind of pointing it face down so I get a really good, solid thing. And it helps to have the light off so I can see the orange real good. There we go. Sometimes you can tell when it, after a while, you can tell when it doesn't, you know it just didn't go all the way. 
Once again, the plane went by. They're gonna, I got to be distracted by that plane that I heard go overhead. I don't know if you guys heard that. Breeze could go through and wave your flame. Your flame tip goes, woo, for a minute. Okay, yeah, so this is my Smith Little Torch. Magnetic stand. Um, I have vertigo, so one of the reasons I I didn't buy this torch without the magnetic stand because if I'm ever sitting here and I get a dizzy spell, even if it's on, I can just set it here. And I'll just lean back until it's safe. So if I start to feel like, whoa, I'll just, it's always right where I can just go clunk. And I wait. And it's facing away and there's nothing here that is flammable. So the flame just goes and I always feel that's cool. <laughs> that's fine. House won't burn down. So yeah. Magnetic also magnetic stands are great because if you're also melting the ends of pins and you want to make little ball ends on things, um clicky. You want like ball ends? Uh like you're doing head pins and you want the ends to be balls. Uh here's the ends of a thing. Like like that. You're making little rivets. We need to make rivet heads on some copper. You can just turn this thing on and just hold the copper pieces and tweezers like melt, 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 melt. It's great. I like the stand. Here is my little butane torch. Little blazer butane torch. Fills in the bottom just like a Zippo. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's been through a lot. Love this little guy. So, I have two more left. I'm going to do one with this, and I'm going to melt one. Come on. No! It's touchy. Fine. Maybe I can, eh. Nope. Sorry, this thing is being a butt. This thing is being stupid and does not want to light for me now. Of course, these things don't last forever. It's been quite a while. Or it could just need refilled or something. I don't know. The sparking mechanism is dead. Well, I guess I'll just use my use my torch then. Why did I turn the light back on? I like to get a nice bushy flame. Just a little bit of orange at the tip. And of course, this is all a matter of personal preference. Some people I see like a big, really lots of orange in their flame. Some people like theirs to just hiss. It's just blue and it hisses. So it's whatever you want. This one we're going to melt. So let's say I'm going on here. Let's say I, because you see I'm moving it around. That's why you could even heat. If you just, if I were just to plant it right there on the join, it's like, oh no, it melts and it comes apart. The ends ball up. Here's what happens. That's what happens. The ends ball up and it gets all sorts of crap. Oh, I have a dish of quench water over there. So I'm going to take that. I like to make a little stack and just make sure they're cool. Now, doing ancient style jewelry, uh, granulation and filigree is a popular technique. What I like to do because they're like, oh no, I lost one. One got wasted. Oh no. Well, I'll just chop those blobby stupid ends off. And that leaves me with a very short, frankly, what you might think, kind of useless piece of uh, fine silver. It's like, what do I do with this tiny length of fine silver? I <laughs> know, that helicopter's here. Uh, you have, this is a little container with some dead rings in it, as you can see. And can you hear that? Those are little granules. 
So when I'm doing granulation and filigree work, what I do is I'll take these little guys, chop off these stupid blobby dumb ends, and those go in the scrap bin. Um, and I take this and I'll take a quarter, depending on the size, I'll take, I'll stack up quarters and I'll just lay that and I'll put it down and I'll trim. Lay it flat and I'll trim right here. I'll literally lay my cutters right on the coin and just go snip and then push it down. Yeah. Push it down, snip, 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 snip. So I have, and then I put little pieces on here, hit them with a torch so they melt and they ball up just like these ends did. I have a bunch of evenly sized, if not exact, pretty darn close to exact size little granules. And I separate them out by how tall my stack of quarters is in separate little bins. So I do granulation work. I, I have plenty. And that goes in the scrap bin. So now we have made links. They are somewhat dried. Now what do we do with them? Well, first, you take your... You move your hot charcoal block out of the way. You got your links. Now you shape them. Oh, there you go. This is a fancy tool that I used to do it. Like the parallel jaw, it goes straight across. Straight. But it's got these. Now, if you've ever done any, like, wire jig work, you're like, holy crap, that's a wire jig on pliers. Yes, it is. And it's amazing. This thing, stupid expensive, but worth every penny because I make yards of this stuff. You get another pair of pliers. You take this. They are already properly spaced. You'll have to experiment with your dowel size and whatnot. I put them on three at a time. And I squeezy. So it makes ovals. Then I take my pliers. I'm going to do this from the back. Just so you can see what I'm doing normally. Normally I'm squeezing this hand and just doing it from the top. But here. From the back, I come in and squeeze the middle. Some people call these little dog bones. Some people call them little bow ties, little eights, whatever you call them. They look like that. They end up looking like this. So I'm going to do these last ones real quick. This is also a good test because when um, when you're doing this, now, okay, you don't need to use something fancy. You can just use this. For years before I got my hands on this thing, I just used a regular pair of pliers. I wonder if you can still see the mark. You can kind of still see just a little bit. It's kind of hard. You kind of see a little black mark. That's where I marked a Sharpie on these guys, and I would put the link on it, and then I would pull it open. And I wound a piece of tape on the bottoms. So the, because I mean the wire's thin. So if you wind some masking tape around there a few times, the wire sort of rests on the masking tape a little bit. So it wouldn't slide down when I pulled. So you can just use these guys. I've also seen people, um, because um, I mean, I want my size to be super even because I make yards of this stuff. So even, even, it's the same every time. If you have a junky pair of these and you have a Dremel and like a cutoff wheel, you can always just notch them. Make a little notch, file it nice and smooth so it won't mar it up. Make sure it's rounded. And you go like that and there you go. Just, just mind how far you pull. So you get nice consistent sizes. Also, it is possible to just pull so hard or in this case, uh, I know my... I know that uh, 
my my seal my join for the fuse because it just melted all into one salt piece i know it's good because this is uh throughout every step there's always a chance it could snap so this is like a good stress test for this we've got our little loopies now what we've got little loopies what do we do well we have to we have to weave them now but they're not shaped for weaving yet. And now see if they call me paranoid, but we anneal them. Now what is annealing? Well, as you work metals, you know, fine silver is very soft as is. Usually when you buy it, it's what they call dead soft, which means it's very, very bendy. And generally, if you bend it, it'll stay. It won't spring back. Like, like this stuff, yeah, it doesn't do that. This is steel. This is stainless steel. This is a bit of binding wire. I like to put them on my wire. But as you work, I know if you've ever taken like a coat hanger and if you weren't able to cut it all the way through, so you're like, oh man, but I need this coat hanger to come apart. You know, you know, you bend it, bend it, bend it, it'll snap. That's because the wire is gets hardened. Wherever you bend or cut, you apply pressure like that or if you hit it with a hammer, it hardens the metal. It's what's called work hardening. So you bendy, 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 and it snaps. These guys get harder and stronger and tougher to work, even though it's fine silver, as you go. So just the act of shaping them, like stretching them out and then squeezing the middle, has hardened it a little bit. Not a whole lot, but uh, generally before every phase, I like to anneal it. I know some people say it's overkill. Some people say yes, good practice. And I'm going to angle this. So it's shady. This is just a Pyrex dish filled with vermiculite. Now, most people for their annealing pan, which is when you heat up the metal and it softens it again. It's like you've seen blacksmithing. You stick it in the fire, you get it hot and you hit it with a hammer. That makes it soft. Metal is hot, makes it soft. If you get silver or fine silver or fine silver, you copper, you know, if you get it hot and you, you cool it down, usually you let it air cool, it will be nice and soft. You can manipulate it. Um, Luckily, with silver, you don't have to wait for it to air cool. Uh, you can just quench it. It's good. You can hit it wide enough to see her weight. So I'm going to re-soften it with fire. Usually I use my big torch, but my big old propane torch. I can get a big bushy flame. Bushy. So I'm just going to heat this up. The What's in the pan is vermiculite. A lot of people will use... Um, been a garden center. This is the fluffy stuff. You get like the, the pea type gravelly stuff. This is not that, obviously. What it does, you're and um, anyone who's done metal work, so we're working like, what? It's fluffy. It's got those air pockets. It'll just eat your heat. Won't it take your heat? Uh, it does. It does eat the heat a bit. This can take a minute. But I want that because this stuff is so thin and delicate. If I did this in a regular mealing pan, which I have, it, um, the chances of you hitting that little line between nice and soft and melt it together in a clump of useless links is very, the window is not very big. But with this, it kind of, because it kind of sucks away some of the heat, um, it doesn't, uh, it kind of slows it down, if that makes sense. It works well for annealing, um, but it does, it does suck some of the heat away because it's the fluffy type. Let's see, usually the ends are pretty cool. There we go. So, ha, -ha. I, I like that hiss. I like that hiss sound, that's nice. But yeah, I put this over it so um, the shadow, so I could see it turn that uh, very dull orange. I don't know if you can see it through the camera, but I can see it. It'll turn nice dull orangey and then you, okay, it's annealed. But also so I can really see, because it's dark, I can see very easily when it gets too hot. Which again, that's a lot of practice. That's practice. I'm going to use a, get some light again so you guys can see. There we go. They have been annealed. They're not dry. Gross yucky shop towel. There we go. So now what do we do? We have to shape them more? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. This is a vise. It's a now first glance is one that's really cool, like multi-provisional vise. Actually, it's kind of crap. Um, 
like the multi-positional thing is only really good if you're doing the light work on it this thing can't do heavy work so um but for this it's just fine i like it because it has height and this is holding a mandrel i have a twin it has a twin there's this twin it's holding a mandrel in the jaws with steps on it so i get different sizes the stepped mandrel some are smooth like ring mandrel this is a stepped mandrel so you get very consistent links so what do we do we take this now depending on the weave we do there is a step i can do after this but i'm not going to do it because that's not what i'm going to well you know what i think i will i'll do it for some i'll do it for some so here we go what do we do we take this and we bend it and it's easy to do because it's annealed. We make a U. We make a little U. I go kind of on the, if we count this, even the base as one, it would be like the middle. Yes, it's easy to do because it's a U. That rhymes, I made a rhyme. So we bent all these. And again, I will be doing this with a lot of things. And here's the thing. Um, machines, I have yet, as much as I keep looking, as far as I know, machines can't do this. They have yet to make a factory machine that can do this style of chain, which is why you don't see it anymore. You see a chain that looks very similar called foxtail, but it's made of two uh, long links of oval chain held together by a smaller ring, and it's real. It looks like almost identical. But if you look closely, you can see that it's actually two links of chain joined together. Anyway, yeah, as far as I know, uh, machines can't do this yet. I always say yet, but yeah, at, like after. The Victorian age, it kind of falls out of fashion because that's when machine-made chains really became like, you know, machine industrialization in general. That really became a thing. So I'm going to move this back. We've got a bunch of U's. Now, it's not half of these. I'm going to do another step. If we are going to do a dense chain, like this guy, we're gonna to need to squish one of these ends, just a little. And again, I'll use the parallel, the parallel pliers because as they go down, as they press down on the link, here, I'll turn it so maybe you can see it. Wish this thing had a really good macro. As it smooshes, it smooshes evenly from both sides. I did used to do this with, uh, regular flat pliers, but it would frequently, because the pressure was coming, you know, it, the, the pressure was coming like this onto a round surface, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, you've seen um, like a dog try to get a ball that's kind of big and it just goes, it does that and it launches out its mouth. Yeah, it would just tend to go ping. So parallel draw pliers are much better for this. You can squeeze it down and you know they're a good size. Actually, that one didn't get squeezed down enough because I was doing it backwards. So we have our links are now shaped again. Another round of shaping. Before we weave them together, guess what that means? Another round of annealing. Yes. Another round of annealing. Now, if you're, little tip, if you're annealing sterling silver, like a piece of sterling, and you're like, I don't know if it's annealed, uh, temperature gauge, Sharpie. And it works well for fine too. So if you are decide to try this at home, and get a little pan of vermiculite and get like a little butane torch, I mean, you can do it with a larger, with a larger propane torch, like the big handheld torches, but um, that gives you like a poof, and you're probably gonna melt a lot of stuff. I recommend a small little handheld butane one. Um, but anyway, this stuff, you stripe it on a piece of sterling, it vaporizes when it, uh, it'll, it'll disappear when it's at annealing temperature for sterling. And it works for fine too. 
at least as far as I've, as I've found. Uh, when I first started, I'm like, oh no, too far, too much. Oh no, not enough, because it's not very easy to bend. It's like, oh, I didn't anneal that enough. Hmm. Um, I w I'll put a piece of sterling right there. Or some some days, you know, you ever go to sit down do a, ta a task, and even though it's something you've done a million times, it's just not working. But you need it to work, because like it's like you can't walk away and come back tomorrow. You have to do it now, because you know the show is tomorrow. <laughs> Not like that's ever happened to me. No, no, I've never done that. No, no, I've never done that. Yeah, yeah, you know when that happens. Yeah, if my brain, if it's just not going, it won't go. I'm like, fine. I will take a piece of scrap silver from my scrap bin, hit it with a sharpie, tuck it right in there, right next to there. When that vaporizes, I'm good. <laughs> it's like, all right, I'm just gonna cheat. I'm not gonna rely on experience or intuition. I'm just gonna. It's not even cheating. I'm just gonna use my little helpy friend. The Sharpie. So, bushy flame, bigger flame. Bushy flame. Doo -doo -doo. We're making it soft so we can weave it. I'm actually trying not to get directly on the silver. I'm kind of like going around the silver. Don't know if you can tell. So it's, it's kind of like if you had a marshmallow, you're not going to like hit the marshmallow with the fire. You're going to put the marshmallow around the fire. There we go. That feels good. There we go. Yeah, usually the ends of these are pretty cool. Usually. I, I've been singed more than once. So now I have links ready to weave. They're ready to weave. How do we do this? Okay, it's very simple. It's our lovely U. This will be our starter U for a simple one in one chain, which we have, which is seen in a lot of Roman, uh, a lot of Roman stuff, decent amount of Roman stuff. Um, Romans liked almost a figure eight chain, which is the exact same chain as what I'm going to be making, except the middles are squeezed. Wait, no, you're one of the squeezy end ones. There we go. Usually these links are big enough. I can do the one one chain where it's like if you just took uh, hair ties. There we go. So you see how this is a loopy? I've squeezed it together, so it's a little teardrop. I wanted to put this on there so I could hold on to the bottom link, and hopefully you guys can see that. So you see a little teardrop. We've got our little U with even sides, and you stick it through the teardrop. See? And you squeeze it. There we go. And you keep doing that and you will get what is called a 1-1 one, one chain, a 1-1 one, one loop and loop chain because each loop goes through the one below it. Now you can take this and do a 2-2 two two chain, which is what these thick ones are. Why are they called the two. Why, why do they have two? Why are like sometimes they're called doubles, sometimes they're called twos, whatever. Uh, that's because each link goes through not only the one below it, but the one below that. Hmm, let's see. It's kind of hard to tell, but there's a link, there's a link, and there's a link. So this, the bottom of this little set of, you know, we have our teardrop, set of the U going through here and coming up. If it was like that, you see how there's that little gap? If we kind of let the top, I'll take this out, if we let it fall, you see how there's that little gap? That little gap right there.
that hole. Not that one, that one. Right there. Right here. That little gap is where we go through, which is why we squeeze the end, one end, one side, real thin. Because we've got this, and now it can fit. Because if you didn't squeeze it, it wouldn't fit. And usually it might have a little... There. That is going through this one and the one above it. You're like, oh no, now what? I have it all. I got this from Harbor Freight. Because you've got, you got one skinny loop and one big loop. What do we do? Well, you put it through the big loop and then the skinny loop. This is why you always anneal a lot. Because you're going to manipulate this thing, these things a lot. Boom. There it is looking good. You take this guy with its little, take the skinny end, the end that's a little tiny like a needle. And you thread that through. And if you can't, like I, now I'm like, ugh, having trouble. That's okay. Take your awl. All in there. And widen your hole. There you go. Now I usually just through part of regular practice. I always go through that hole with my awl. Anyway. Sometimes you might find you didn't squeeze it enough. Like in the case of this one, which is fine. Because it's been annealed. So you squeeze it a bit more. through where I'm going to be sticking the next one. There we go. Oh, I have a big open loop, a big loopy left, so I'm just going to squeeze it. Kind of hear Brian outside with a kiddo. My uh, my shop window's opened and it's opened onto the back lawn. Okay, now we've made this. See the top? It looks a little off. It looks so weird, doesn't it? That's fine. You can take your take some pliers, the same round the same round pliers you use to squeeze in the middles, and even it up. And there you go. You you're weaving a chain now. If whether you do the double weave. Or you do the one 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 weave, do the one one weave, or if you do, where is it? You do one of the weaves where, okay, a little bit more complicated. This is a double weave, but you're like, wait, there's four loops at the top. That's because at the bottom, it's an X. You put one, you put down one of your eights, your little bow ties, put down the other bow tie, like that. And you bet, and they're bent up. And sometimes it can be tricky to start if you're not used to it. So you can like stick your all through them or let another piece of wire to like hold it how you want it. I know some people who just, when they're doing that, they'll just, like I didn't do that on this, but, um, oh wait, I did. That's right. They'll just fuse them together. They'll just layer them and fuse. They'll just like, they'll just fuse them together so it holds. Cause yeah, that's right. These are smaller, more 20 gauge, I believe, smaller links for this guy. So I wanted it to stay and it was being annoying. So you can they'll solder the end, they'll just put a little solder right there where they join so they just they don't go anywhere. Yeah. And so you you go up and then you keep you you alternate directions. Kind of like those boondoggles, if you remember those when you were a kid with the you know the uh, Rex lace things, the plastic lace. Yeah, kind of like that. So you, know, you have your U and you have your other U, so you go through this U. And you go through, because then all of a sudden it'd be like that. You go through this one. So, again, just keep, you just keep alternating. That's how that one works. But you say, Brandy, I've made my chain, but it looks wonky. 
why is it wonky and uneven? Yeah, look, this is kind of like stiff in spots. That's because this isn't done. This is unfinished. This is a, we made 24 gauge length. Um, but yeah, you see how it's kind of kinked up here and it's a little wonky. Like, what do I do? Well, you coil it up very carefully. Now, you usually don't have to do this with the, um, the, the one, the single chains or even, even these guys, usually you don't. Um, but something like this is kind of fine. Like it's, it's like getting downright stiff in areas. Uh, you, what you're going to want to do is very carefully anneal it very carefully, kneel it again. Also it's very dense and you will use what is called a draw plate. Draw plate hides all the sins. Is draw plate. I know it looks like something else, but it's a draw plate. It's for metalworking, I swear. You take your draw plate. And this is just a piece of brass wire. And I'm not going to actually pull it through. I'm not going to pull these through the draw plate because they're not done. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a finishing step. I don't like to do this unless I have to. But uh, I'm going to pull it through a too large hole so you know. What you would do is you take your chain, which has its unevenness. Like, you see the end? See how it's, like, kind of weird? Kind of like, it's like, you can tell it's like, meh, meh, meh. That's because as it, as it was weaving or forming the links, the use, like the ends were not perfect. One was a little higher than the other or something. That's fine, because this step will fix it. What you would do is you take this guy. Actually, oh, I have a piece of Viking weave, I think, on the floor over here. I can, I can pull it through with that, too, to show you. Um, but you take this and just pretend this is... This large hole is the right hole. Now you would take something that fits the right size and you would go through and you would go down smaller and smaller and it would get harder and harder. Like this is not, it shouldn't be doing this. It sh I should have to like pull, like you have to pull. That's why I have this. And uh, if it's, if I'm gonna be like really squeezing it down, I would have, um, I have some pliers here with really big gnarly teeth that I grip onto this with and I yank and you pull it right through the hole and the pressure of you pulling, the pressure of you doing that will just even everything out and it will be beautiful. It'll make it nice and even and it'll look like you did everything beautifully and perfectly right from the start. The draw plate. Let me see if this is what I think it is here. Is this what I think it is? No. It's braid. Oh man, I thought it was wire weave. Nope. It's braid. It is a braid I did. Oh dang. I thought that was wire weave. Viking wire weaving is also a technique for your, the last stage is a draw plate where you pull it down and it evens out your weave and it makes it look all beautiful and even. And again, draw plate hides a lot of sins. It is, it is a very useful tool to have. If you like to do lots of wire work, especially make chain things, you draw it through here. It'll, it just squeezes everything down to a nice even size. It's made of wood, so it's not going to hurt your metal or anything. There are metal draw plates, obviously. They use those for making wires. I use them for making rivets and wires and like drawing down wire and things. But this, this is made for taking your essentially finished product and shrinking it down and making it nice and even and smooth. Um, yeah, like this one. This one I did draw down. This one I would. Um, this one is a. Sh this one is uh, actually a completed chain. This one has been drawn down, and you see it's all slinky, beautifully slinky and sneaky. Because after you draw it down, it might be a little stiff in spots where it got squeezed. So what you do is you just play with it. You literally just do this. You, you play with it, you run over your fingers, because see, you should run over and be smooth, but you see how it's got... Oh, yeah. That? No. That? No. It should be like that. So after I draw, once I make this length I want and I draw it down, um, I'm going to be spending a good 10 minutes here just going, Woo, just playing with the snake, with the silver snake and drawing it through my fingers. And then you have to test all the angles so it's nice and slinky.
at it from all sides, if that makes sense. So, so it wears well. This is going to be having, I picked this guy. I don't know what stone this is. I got to ask Brian, but uh, I picked this stone. I'm going to set it like that and to do some pretty filigree and stuff and gran granulation filigree. Do some pretty work, make it look ancient and Romany, and put hooks on the end. Because that's one thing they would do is they would put hooks on uh, both sides of a pendant. So this would go around and that would have, you'd have a nice little, it'll be like that. It'll be like that, and probably have something here. Probably, uh, maybe I'll just make a little point. I don't know. But yeah. That's what this is going to be. Um, there are lots of different weaves. There is a book if you really think this technique is cool and you want to learn more. This is the best book. Uh, lives in my shop. This. Classical Loop and Loop Chains and Their Derivatives by Jean Reist. Reist. Not sure. Stark and Jacqueline Reese Smith, or uh, sorry, Josephine. So Jean and Josephine, Reist, Reese, Smith and Stark, classical loop and loop chains. This is the best book there is. There's even a recipe in the back for the proper, uh, for their uh, gold alloy that is very close because it, you know, 22 karat gold is not pure gold. They have other metals stuck in there. So their gold alloy that's, um, a really close match to the actual. Oh, you see, there's the one-one chain on the cover, and right there's that Roman chain where it's this. It's the one-one chain, but the middles have been squeezed. So it looks like you're weaving figure eights, and what you do is you, is you have to smoosh the end and weave it together. Anyway, ah, that may be a later one, but there are uh, actually there's a there's a I am a YouTube I have a. Uh, those Sinclair jewelry on YouTube. I have a time lapse of me building a necklace with those chains. So, with the Roman type chains. So yes, this is an awesome book. If you love this technique, you should buy it. Definitely should. Um, oh, put that back. There we go. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed my video of how to make the loop and loop chains. How I this is how I make the chains. This is what I spend a good chunk of time doing in the workshop, making chains. As you see, it's a very long, kind of drawn-out process, but the results are so pretty. The results are so nice, and there's so much you can do with these. I've uh, made a few of the other types, which are, if you look at ancient Roman jewelry, it looks like almost like a dog collar sort of necklace, where it's like wide, and they're looped together. Yeah, I've made those. I love those really thick silver mesh things. Oh, so nice. They feel so good. To see, like, on your wrist, the weight is good. And just, of course, the, the feel. It's very sinuous and snaky and smooth and just feels nice. I love these chains. That's the reason. I love the look and I just the, this, the tactile joy of wearing and playing with these things is really hard to match. They're just so nice. Anyway, then fine silver's pretty because that stuff, like, takes forever to tarnish if it does at all. So, um, yeah, that's my... Um, what does that sound? Oh, that's the tape. There. Um, yeah. Bird. Um, so yeah, that is my class, how to loop move chain. So if you don't need the super fancy tools, you can do things with a little butane torch. These guys. These mandrels. I got these mandrels. They come in a pair. I got two. They came in a blister pack at Michael's, like this. I just got two, so I had, you know, matches. I had spares and matches and stuff. So there we go. Yeah, Michael's, um, uh, the charcoal block, any fire safe surface, even fire brick, you can use that if you're careful. Um, I have so many different surfaces to work on, but I like charcoal block if you're starting out. Um, you might not want a charcoal block because the process seems to go very quickly on a charcoal block. On a charcoal block, um, some of the other like um, if you go to jeweler supply and you look up the um, the soldering section, and you look at the various surfaces. Uh, the other ones, this this reflects a lot of heat, so again it goes fast. But when I so using charcoal at first, I hated it, 
because yeah, it would just, it would melt a lot. But as I got better, as I practiced and got better, um, I hated it was so slow on all the other surfaces. So I switched to charcoal and that's what this block, this, this is my dedicated, this is the block I only use for fusing silver. I do not solder on this block. I just don't. I have other charcoal blocks for that because I don't want flux or anything to get on there and mucking at my fine silver. Anyway, that's just a other thing. Um, yeah, I can't really think of anything else. Um, yeah. Any questions real quick before I go? I'm watching the bottom of the screen. So if you know questions, I will, well, I put things away. Actually, what am I doing? Well, no, I'm going to put stuff away real quick. If anyone has questions, you can type it. I'm going to put some things away because I need to, I do need to make more links, but I don't need to have this out while I'll be uh, sawing links. So I will prep to rewind my process and get my tape out. <laughs> Super cool. Yay, no problem. I'm glad you liked it, Dan. This this is what uh, Dan's my brother-in-law. This is what your sister-in-law does a lot. <laughs> a decent amount of time in the workshop is I make lots of chains. So, um, yeah. I'm going to get back to work so I can make more of the pretties and finish, finish um, this other chain here. This one's not quite long enough. And I have a commission for a pretty uh, pearl and chain bracelet. And this is the size I need, so I'll be doing more of these guys for that bracelet. This is not used for that. That will turn into another necklace, probably. Ah, get my scrap away. So yeah, well, thank you for showing up, and I'm going to be signing off. Have fun, stay safe in quarantine. Oh, and if this was cool and you want to learn more metal stuff, I have, um, I just went blank. Singular Jewelry on YouTube. So just like Singular Jewelry YouTube. I have more process videos. I put up um, some other live streams I did of how to draw things. Um, if you want to try, learn Celtic art. Um, yeah, process videos. You see us, there's one where I, we do casting. Um, we're, we're doing a silver pour in the basement, which that's always fun to watch. Um, fun to do. I like doing it. It's fun. Pouring melted, molten metal is fun. It just is. It just is. Uh, so I will think of other cool things to hopefully entertain everyone with uh, in the future as we are all sit in quarantine and stay safe and wash our hands. So I'll be seeing you all later. Bye. Thank you for showing up. And again, stay safe. Wash your hands.